Welcome to FII ThinkPod. My name is Francisco. And I'm Aziz. And at ThinkPod, we speak about the smartest ideas and the biggest challenges facing the world right now. We speak about where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. In today's episode of ThinkPod, we talked to Manal Mahada, a professor at UN6P. We talked about the future of agriculture in Morocco and beyond, smart and sustainable ways to irrigate and fertilize, and how it's vital that scientists talk to farmers and give real value back to them at the end of the research. So agriculture contributes more than a third of global greenhouse emissions. Yeah. What can be done to reduce this footprint in terms of agriculture? It's a good question. As a researcher, I can say that uh, we can contribute through, uh, we can say, reasonable and also uh, some smart ways of applying fertilizers, smart and sustainable ways to, to irrigate, to, to think about, and also to involve and to work with new tools such as uh, smart agriculture and uh, using uh, imagery. Uh, any new tool can be used to agriculture to minimize the use of pesticides. So you're a researcher, right? And, and a lot of research, especially in the area of agriculture, it seems like it doesn't see the light, it never gets materialized. Yeah. How do you feel about that topic and where are you on that debate? This is one of the problematic we, we live. Uh, uh, as a researcher, I think that doing research at the lab is very easy. And uh, especially with the new tools, we can, we can use precise science uh, and produce precise da data too. But delivering it to the farmer is something which is very hard for two reasons. The first reason is that uh, sometimes we don't speak the same language. I'm not here speaking about Arabic or Amazigh or English, but we don't try to understand him and his needs. And uh, that uh, uh, led us to, uh, to the second uh, problem, which is the acceptance of, uh, of innovation from the farmer. He, uh, farmers are, they tend also, uh, usually to, to reject our ideas, and this is only due to the lack of communication between scientists and the research and the farmer. And how are you building the relationship between research and farmers? And how do you overcome those barriers? Yeah, I'm speaking uh, from my, my experience with farmer. Uh, I prefer and I always recommend to scientists to, to get inspired from the field and get inspired from the farmer because he is the only one who knows, who really knows the real challenges of his field, of his crop. And I recommend to students with whom I'm working and also a researcher to, 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 to take their uh, hypothesis and also their, their uh, I can say, their research uh, proposals from the field and from the farmers. I, I sense a strong sense of passion there. You know, so we would, love to, yeah. we would love to know about the beginning of your relationship with the topic of farming. Do you come from the background of farmers? How did you get into it? And what research are you doing that's exciting you right now today? <laughs> In Morocco, uh, we can say that uh, all families are farmers, but I think it didn't come from that. Uh, it's a passion that grows with me, uh, I don't know how, but I found myself uh, doing uh, studying plants in my bachelor degree and also studying biodiversity in my master. Uh, with a lot of passion and love, I continued the adventure of research as a PhD and a postdoc. And each time there is something, an area of research I'm in. So I don't think it was something, uh, for example, that changed my mind and helped me to, to turn to agriculture. No, I just found myself doing it. So let's talk about your research. You focus a lot on quinoa. Yeah. What's the importance of quinoa? Quinoa was a starting point for me, and it was uh, an opportunity for me to apply in the field what I learned first, and it helps me to, to change and to learn. For, for quinoa, it was a turning point in my life where I started uh, a small company when I was preparing my PhD, and uh, I start learning. Well, I learned uh, during the, the, the quinoa uh, experience, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned how to, uh, to, to talk to people, how to, to try to, to, to understand the farmer, to understand the market, something that I didn't study before, and to, to start worrying about the marketing, about uh, the packaging, all the, those areas that I really never had a course and a class on that. So you took that interesting route where you're a researcher and academic, but you took that passion and you turned it into entrepreneurship, right? Talk to us about that journey and that experience and talk to us about the company that you created. Yeah, it was a nice, very nice journey indeed that helped me to, to shape uh, the research I'm doing today. 
entrepreneurship, uh, it was a turning point and uh, it helped me to, to understand first who I am and uh, which person I want to be in the future. Is it someone who just uh, receiving, uh, doing science and uh, publishing paper or someone looking for, for impact, for looking for changing lifestyles and the livelihood of, of farmers mainly. And the tool was quinoa, and quinoa is just a model. So now we, are, we started with quinoa, and, and later in, in the research group, we are now tackling other crops like cowpea, which is a forgotten crop in, in Africa, and uh, who knows, maybe we will be tackling others. And the model of quinoa needs to be duplicated. And here I, I strongly invite uh, researchers and students who are doing studies in agriculture or in business. They can just took one forgotten crop and they can develop diff different recipes starting from it and uh, start uh, commercialization, etc. And here they can start, they can build their, th themselves and they can build some community of farmers and also they can bring back uh, a forgotten crop to the market. Is entrepreneurship something you encourage to your students? Yes, always. It's something they, they need to, uh, to do during their curriculum. Entrepreneurship is a way of thinking. Maybe one day we will end up closing our, uh, the company, but the mindset remains uh, the same. So entrepreneurship in science, entrepreneurship in business, it's just a spirit that we can use in, in our, our home and also in our uh, offices or uh, work. So we actually did a, at the FI Institute, we did a really interesting paper, a white paper about biodiversity. And one of the topics we talked about was uh, quinoa as a superfood. We talked about how quinoa or superfoods overall had a rise phase and they fell and they rose yes. again. One concern that we had with not just quinoa, but just those forgotten crops that we talk about, sometimes they can be too energy intensive, they might have negative effects. Our question for you is a two-part question. Do you think there are some farming concerns with some of these superfoods? One. And two, there's been, for example, uh, an example that's been used in Mexico, where increasing demand has been impacting, for quinoa, for example, yeah. has been impacting local communities. Mm -hmm. So where do you see yourself, yourself on, that, on that? Very important point that you raised now. When I say we need to go back to nature to, to get some inspiration, to look for genes, to look for some uh, resistant treats. As you see now, we are living in a changing world. And climate, and we need to adapt. And the way, one of the ways to adapt our agriculture is to tap into biodiversity, to look for genotypes that are, uh, for example, tolerant to heat, tolerant to salinity. And maybe quinoa now is growing, is, uh, grows very well in Latin America and uh, some places in Africa. In the next few years, with the climate change, with the increasing of the temperature, maybe, and the salinity, maybe it can fit more in other places than in the native place. So uh, here the importance of knowing first the impact of climate change and, of to, and to be ready and preparing our germoplasm, our seeds for the future. So, uh, and also that we have the example of, of cowpea, which is mainly produced in Africa and consumed in Africa, but it's a food which is packed with the nutrients and also packed with proteins and that can help uh, to, to create a good food system. And also, we talked now about the, the problem that, uh, that are raised when we, we overuse a crop. Uh, yes, you're right, now, now for some of the natives from Latin America, they suffer, they, they don't have access to quinoa with the price they used to, it used to be. How I, how can I say, how I contribute to, to reduce this is we, we can produce our local quinoa uh, with the, the varieties and genotypes that they can grow in Morocco. And it doesn't impact what the, the, the agriculture or what the Bolivian or the Peruvian are doing in their homes. So uh, what I encourage is to produce locally. So can you summarize, what does a good food system look like? Yeah, it's an integrative approach where human is in the center first because uh, he will be, uh, the human will be uh, thinking about uh, crops, they will be rotating. For example, we can rotate, uh, we can have uh, uh, legumes and cereals and also pseudo cereals. Uh, a good food system should uh, respect environment. So we need to plant trees, we need to, to use smart fertilizers, we need to irrigate with the rationally. 
uh, and the good food system need to take in consideration the need of uh, need to answer to the need of the market. So we need to prepare good seeds, good grains uh, that are we can say packed with the nutrients and the and the nutritional values. On a previous episode, we spoke to David Rosenberg from Area Farms. What are your thoughts on vertical farms and what impact do you think that will have on agriculture? Yeah, vertical farming is something uh, which is, I think, it is good to, to answer to the food security. Uh, it will help people living in cities uh, to give them access to, to some, some vegetables, fresh fruit vegetables. And also it will help to reduce the carbon footprint for their vegetables. And um, yeah, it's something nice to have. Uh, the technology is still, is still expensive. And this is, this is maybe the efforts uh, companies and startups need to invest in, is to, to make it accessible for people in, uh, uh, in different countries. And uh, I think there is a market for that. So you talked about human-centered design, and then you previously talked about the fact that research should always start and end with the farmers, yeah. with them being in the center. So we need to give them value back. Yeah. What do you envision that value looking like? A seed can be, uh, for example, a uh, seed, a fertilizer, a smart fertilizer, can be a technology, for example, for irrigation, can be a tool, uh, for example, uh, a tool uh, that will help the farmer to assess the disease, to, to monitor the irrigation. So there are different ways. So research can give us uh, many solutions. Also something that crossed my mind, uh, a seed which is, that contains uh, fertilizer, that contains some nutrients as a starter. So uh, this is maybe, uh, I think, uh, the farmer is waiting for uh, some good and uh, impactful answers from, from researchers. Do you think we're failing farmers right now? Do you think there's some lag, whether through academia, whether through policy making, whether through entrepreneurship, where farmers are being given the short end of stick? Yeah, there is a gap between uh, between the farmer and uh, between the research. So I'm a researcher, so I can speak on behalf of my colleagues. So uh, we always tend to come and give the farmer a solution. We never uh, go and ask him. Maybe we see the challenge and the problem with him, but we don't ask him how he deal with that and how uh, what what solution he is he's, uh, he's thinking about. So uh, our role as the researcher is to go to the farmer, to share space with him, to share food with him, and uh, to spend time uh, listening to him, and uh, la like doing this um, participative approach with the, with the farmer. For example, when we develop a technology, for example, uh, when we find a new variety and we are, uh, we are, uh, we are um, assessing or evaluating its performance, agronom agronomic performance, we can go to the farmer, do the trial there, and he will see uh, the, the, the difference between the conventional way he's doing things and the new thing that we are, we are suggesting. So this is the approach I really like. And this is how I work. So I prefer to work with, uh, with small farmers and few farmers who can see the impact and who later on they will talk about the impact to their, to their neighbors. And sometimes they don't just, they don't talk. The, the field is open and anyone who is going by the, the field, he's looking, he's seeing the difference. <laughs> so this is, this is a, 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 a play, uh, land which is fertilized with this. Uh, fertilizer who was suggested by uh, by this researcher and this is a conventional trial <laughs> so this is it speaks so uh, we don't have to make uh, some publicity or to invest more on that so uh, it's uh, it speaks more than that wow. in your home country of Morocco how is climate change affecting the lives of people there water scarcity uh, now where it's something that uh, water scarcity and also salinity uh, now we are struggling with areas that are uh, lacking of water and uh, in the last few years there were uh, productive areas of uh, cereals and uh, of uh, legumes and now we can't cultivate anymore those, uh, those crops. We really start to, to feel the impact lately. For example, in um, Morocco, in the last 10 years, we were exporting chickpea. Now we're importing more than 50% of our needs. And this is very alarming. What will be the long-term effects of that? If you see the scenarios of climate change, Morocco is one of the countries that will be suffering the most from the climate change. Our plan, and uh, we have many uh, governmental plans, 
that think about desalinization, water desalinization, and also start uh, turning into uh, biosaline agriculture and looking uh, into uh, some native, uh, native crops that are uh, tolerant to, to harsh environments. So we have a lot of work to do and uh, the reflection is still, is still uh, ongoing. So Professor, you're a, you're a supervisor for your students at your university, yeah. right? What do you see in their eyes and in their minds as the problems they're most curious about when it comes to agriculture? We can say uh, students are my, are my friends, so I don't feel that um, there's a big difference between me and them. So I really like uh, speaking with them all day. So I, uh, I have students from different backgrounds. The ones that are involved in agriculture are mostly conscious about the importance of, uh, of uh, the use of biofertilizer and also the, use, the sustainable use of uh, fertilizer in general. And uh, some of them, they are working on, on smart delivery of bacteria, of biofertilizers. And some are very uh, interested in, in the geospatial distribution of species and how the climate change will, will impact the distribution of species in the world. And uh, I'm not very specialized, but I'm working horizontally with students. And uh, lately, we, are, we start working with some with mad, uh, mad students to develop models for prediction of climate change. So I enjoy the, uh, each one's journey, and I am very excited to see their results and publications in the future, and also their impact on farmers. Something I always say, it's not only about publications, it's about the impact we're creating uh, for the farmer. Seeing your students and their work, are you hopeful for the future of Morocco and beyond? Yes, I'm very hopeful. They are full of energy and uh, it's their way to serve the country. And Absolutely. this is the, what they have. So uh, some days they are serving in the military and we are serving in the labs and the farm. So this is our way to do it. Professor, speaking about being full of energy, you're so radiant and you're so passionate about <laughs> both you. your research and the element of teaching. We wanted to end on a very important question. What type of legacy do you hope to leave? I can say if any one of us can do some small actions without spending energy to move from country to country and sometimes without even having uh, a lot of uh, resources, we can contribute with what we write on social media, with what, how we impact people by our papers and the, the science we are doing. Yes, the challenges are big, but I think now we are more armed and more ready to face the challenges. Very inspiring words. Thank you, yeah. Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you. We would love you to let others know about this podcast. So please rate us, leave us a comment, and share with someone who might enjoy it too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our next episode.